Benton Baptist Church on either side of the sanctuary, as you can tell in the pictures, had one whole wall, nothing but stained glass windows on one side and on the other side. The images were symbolic, and they have stood for over 40 years. I would have loved to have been able to find the picture of the Rose of Sharon. I looked at all the pictures I had, and all the pictures I had, you think I had the Rose of Sharon? Nah, didn't have it. Uh, but that is one of the pictures, just to give you an image of what they look like. But they had different, uh, different scenes, such as the cross and the crown, the crown of thorns, the Holy Spirit coming as the dove, the cup of God's bountiful blessing, which I think that's what that one may be. Uh, also, uh, they had the, the Star of David over the manger, very impressive. And then the Lily of the Valley, and each one of these were what I call a sermon in stained glass. When we think about uh, the beauty and the majesty of the love of God, and as we are also celebrating Valentine's, love is expressed in the Song of Solomon, especially in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. But in love is expressed in the Song of Solomon as an acknowledgement, affection, and affirmation of the other's worth. And Christ's love for us, our love for Christ, is one of acknowledgement and affection and affirmation of the other's worth. And sometimes it's not always easy to preach from the Song of Solomon. So let me just kind of give you a little bit of background about one of the sermons in stained glass. I, as you picture the Rose of Sharon, let me show you what a real Rose of Sharon looks like. That is the Rose of Sharon. Um, it's not the rose that we think of, but very beautiful. As we hold that up there for a moment, the Song of Solomon is also known as the Song of Psalms. It can be translated literally as the best song. It's a love song, and yes, it is a lover's song. It's Hebrew poetry set to music, and it has a definite prophetic edge. Bible scholars will tell us that it's a love song celebrating human love at every level in the blessing and context of marriage. And at another level, it serves as a symbol of the intimate love relationship between God and His covenant people. And, specifically, Christ and His bride, the church. As we have our Bibles, turn with me then to Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, as we read the text of the Rose of Sharon in just a moment, the Lily of the Valley in mind. I am the Rose of Sharon, and the Lily of the Valleys, like a lily among the thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Like an apple tree among the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. As we think about uh, the Rose of Sharon and the Lily of the Valley, I think there's a picture of the, the Lily of the Well, there's different varieties of the Rose of Sharon. I just thought I'd let the picture say a thousand words. Um, Albert Barnes says that um, in basically uh, in the plain of Sharon uh, was fertile and was known for a variety of flowers. And what is implied, especially in the springtime, and what is implied here is beauty and fragrance. The rose, even in ancient Israel, was an object of fragrant beauty and delight. That's a little bit of a snapshot of the, uh, of the rose. Also, the snapshot of the lily, which we just had up there. Not what I had in mind, actually. I, I, as I was doing some research on this, make sure I had it right, fact-checking myself, um, I remember this. Sometimes reality is different than what we sometimes imagine it to be. Uh, that is a different uh, type of lily than what maybe we're used to. But the lily of the valley, uh, its root word means bright and cheerful. The focus, again, is on beauty and on purity, as well as a symbol for love. And the lily, this version, has, uh, and there are other different versions of it as well, but very similar, they all have fragrance. Dr. Matthew Poole, one of my favorite expositors from a long time ago, says that the lily of the valleys is mentioned because they grew and thrived in the low, waterish grounds on which the Sharon plain was such. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah 35, 1 and 2, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. 
The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. As we think about that rose and think about that lily, on a more traditional note, uh, there's a, a, a rose that we all are familiar with, Red. Uh, back in Benton, we had one of our church members, his name was, I always called him Brother Buddy, but a lot of people call him Mr. Buddy. I will not mention his last name for obvious reasons. And uh, he loved to grow roses at his house. And he had one that he specialized in. And yes, I did fact check it because I'm like, I thought maybe he just nicknamed it. But when I looked it up, yeah, he was right. Uh, it was called a Mr. Lincoln rose. Anybody ever seen a Mr. Lincoln rose? Yes, indeed. That's a really nice, really, you know, really, really nice rose. And so every time I would uh, make a house call to, to visit he and his wife and, and uh, you know, visit with them for a little bit, have a word of prayer, before I leave or the house, well, first thing, the minute I walked in, he made sure he had the coffee ready. And we talked about strong coffee. It was good. Uh, and then when we were leaving, he goes out, he, he says, well, he goes out to where his uh, rose uh, bushes are and would cut one. He said, now take that to your wife or take that to your bride. And so we, I would try to bring the Mr. Lincoln rose home. Uh, just He took pride in them. And they were beautiful and, yes, very fragrant. As we apply this first part of the text, the bride and the groom view each other with affection and affirmation. This Valentine's, this month of February in particular, do we view our loved ones with that same type of affection and affirmation? Be much in prayer that we do, and be much in prayer that we will. Do we view one another as part of the uh, collective body and bride of Christ tonight? Do we view each other with that same affection and affirmation? We can. The emphasis is on delight. Obviously, if we're talking about married relationship, then our spouse is God's gift. We are to delight in them and in the Lord. Uh, as we think about maybe uh, broadening that a little bit, as we think about friendships, especially those friendships that are close to us and special to us, uh, there is that sense of delighting in that as well. And obviously, the church is the bride of Christ. She is to, to delight in the love of Jesus, knowing that he takes great delight in his bride. He takes great uh, pleasure in his bride. Because of Christ, you and I can be a thing of spiritual beauty, spiritually fragrant. So as we go into this month, are we delighting in him? And are we delighting in his love for us today? There's so much more to the Christian life than just simply make do. Uh, there's, there's so much more to the Christian life than simply endure. Now, there's a time where you have to make do. There's a time where you've got to plant your feet and stand your ground and endure. I get that. Do the, you know, be be the, the good soldier that God has called you to be. But there's so much more to the Christian life than just those two elements. That sense of delighting in the Lord, that joy of the Lord, that is our strength. The Bible tells us as we... All those, these passages are directed to husband and wife. But think about the bride of Christ, of which you and I are a part of tonight. If you are saved, not if you're a member of Chucky Baptist Church, but rather as a saved person who happens to be a member of the, uh, of the body that currently here calls itself Chucky Baptist, but the larger body of Christ. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Ephesians 5, 25 and 28. Also uh, going actually back Earlier in that text, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. In Revelation 19, 7 and 9, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. Who is the Lamb? That is Jesus. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. 
I had the privilege of performing a wedding not well, it's been a little while ago, but I guess now. And in that wedding, I used those same verses I just shared. And as I was sharing with the, let's see, did right the, had the bride and the groom standing there. And as I shared, uh, I said, you know, picture not just what's going on here, but picture the larger uh, image of Christ and His church. Him being sacrificial, loving the church. And I said, that's how you would love your, your, your bride, as Christ loves the church, being willing to give of yourself to her. And then, of course, the bride loving uh, the husband, as the, the church is to love Christ and, and submitting uh, to His Spirit-filled leadership within us. It's a beautiful picture, so that day is coming when, uh, when Jesus comes again in Revelation I believe chapter 19, uh, the, the ultimate uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. I would challenge you to think that every wedding, well, maybe every, almost every wedding that you perhaps have ever been to, I can think of some that might not meet that criteria, but generally 99% of every wedding you've ever been to is when you see that going on, that is a foretaste of the, of the marriage of the Lamb of which you and I will be a part of. All because God has loved us so much that He has chosen to make that happen. So yes, the, the rose and the lily is a symbol of delight. And let us delight in the Lord. Let us delight in one another as part of the bride of Christ. But number two, the rose and the lily is what I call a symbol of devotion. So there are two ways to look at it. Sometimes uh, biblical scholarship they don't always agree with the, with the uh, interpretation. So I'm going to give you both interpretations. I think both actually uh, fit the text. First, there's what I call the devotion by the groom. Now keep in mind in the context that it's a, a love song that's written by Solomon. Uh, that he has met this woman that we know in the scriptures to be the Shumanite. I probably am butchering the language, so just bear with me. The Shuma, Shumanite. Okay, the, the woman in the text. Okay, I don't know how to pronounce that. I should. That's, that's sad. But I'm just, I think it's the Shumanite woman. Uh, he has met her and has fallen head over heels in love with her. Now, some people say, well, when did that happen? Because if you know anything about Solomon, he had a slew of wives and almost as many concubines. And now, a lot of those marriages were political marriages for alliances and diplomacy, but the Bible says that Solomon clung to these in love. I don't know if love is quite the word I would use, but there you go. Uh, Solomon did not make wise choices, even though he was the wisest man on earth. But when it came to love, he didn't always follow the will of the Lord. Uh, many biblical scholars, myself included, believe that this is from a time when Solomon is younger, uh, before he has acquired a large era, let's just call it what it is, uh, before all of that has taken place, so that, that love is still in its early stages. Uh, Charles Spurgeon says that the statement of this text is being made by the groom. Solomon saw himself as the object of his bride's desire and delight, and he acknowledged that, and he affirmed that. He's not... He's not copying an ego like, oh man, how great I am, you know. Uh, no, he's not saying that, but rather uh, he's acknowledging that to encourage, perhaps, to affirm and build up his bride's self-esteem. Because she sees herself as a lowly flower, uh, in essence, basically, you know, and here he is, a stately apple tree. And so he is encouraging her. That's one possible uh, interpretation. It's the groom comparing himself to the rose and to the lily for fragrant beauty, and applied to Jesus Christ, he is both. His church responds to him. He says, the rose of the field, as others would translate it, that is Matthew Poole, um, which may note that Christ is not only pleasant and beautiful, but free and communicative, offering himself to all that comes to him. What a beautiful picture of, of the love of God. Even though it's uh, uh, couched in a love story between Solomon and his bride, but is a symbol of a much greater love story between God the Father and the people of Israel in covenant relationship, and specifically of Christ and his bride. In that same text, the other women, um, the, the wives that uh, perhaps uh, Solomon would be infamous for, are some, if you read the entire passage, which uh, I, I encourage you want some really beautiful reading. And especially in this month that is dedicated to love, read 
Song of Solomon. It is a, it is a, a beautiful, poetic love story. Read it. Uh, and, and with an eye towards uh, Christ's love for the church and an our love for him. And so the reference is made that, uh, the, to these other women perhaps being compared to painful thorns. When he hears his true love, all others are nothing more than thorns. She is the choicest. There's no comparison. And assuming that Charles Spurgeon and Matthew Poole and many of the other Bible scholars are correct on that, then he's acknowledging his role as the object of her love. He's unique. He's good for her, and she was unique and good for him. So it's a devotion then that is, that is affirming. It is a devotion that is showing affection and acknowledgement for uh, that other person. I believe that's one uh, way to look at the devotion of the groom. But then there's also the devotion of what I call the bride. Bible scholars such as Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown teach us that this text is the declaration of the bride, and I see where they get that from. They say, and I quote, the bride thus speaks of herself as lowly, though lovely, in contrast with the lordly apple tree, the bridegroom. So the lily applied to her means beauty and delicacy and lowliness are to be in her as much as they are in him. And many other scholars that state that this particular text about the, the rose and the lily is that of one of its humble and holy and healthy self-image. Maybe see, she saw herself as a mere wildflower, but to the groom, to Solomon in particular, she is a beautiful wildflower. One that he delighted in, one that he greatly desired, one that he wanted to cultivate other scholars may uh, express that she's showing humility and therefore the groom is, is elevating her above all others. I believe that that's also appropriate in the text. She is his beautiful flower, not some wild weed. Now, let's apply that tonight. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter uh, where you've been. In the eyes of God in Jesus Christ, he sees you and me as that beautiful flower. He, he delights in us. He desires to have us in that covenant relationship, which then also means that we can look to him as the object of our heart's desire, saying, Lord, I know that you love me because I know that you know everything I've ever thought, everything I've ever said, everything I've ever done. Or, even worse, the things that I should have thought and did not, the things that I should have said and did not, and the things that I should have done and chose not to, and you love me anyway, and you desire to, to cultivate that. What an awesome and mighty God that we serve. Some modern love letters and loved ones use vivid imagery. Nowadays, with, uh, with the thought of smartphone, uh, is all memes. You know, we communicate by memes a lot. But back in the old days, it was actual love letters and uh, poems. Cards are still out there. Walk in Walmart. I mean, Christmas hadn't even got over with good, and they already had February. I mean, it was it was even it was still December in one Walmart. I'm like, would you at least let the sleigh kind of slow down? Because you know, it ran roughshod over over the turkey of Thanksgiving. <laughs> I mean, come on, you know, at least uh, let us get over the skid marks on that thing. Uh, but anyway, no, seriously, um, you know, some of these letters, it's basically using images to share how much one loves. During Valentine's Day, all these cards, millions of cards, are shared between loved ones. And they nearly all bear images and inscription that, in effect, are saying, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Now, there are variations on the theme, and some are funny, some are, some are so much syrup that it's like cane sugar. I'm like, come on, really? You know? Others are like, I've read one or two, like, okay, not quite sure what you got on that one, but uh, it's out there, you know, so sometimes we come across those. But this idea of how do I love thee, let me count the ways. Solomon and the Shulamite, I got it right. Not Shunammite. If I said Shunammite, scratch that from the record. Here's the right one. Solomon and the Shulamite uh, bride are in effect counting the ways that they love and admire each other in this lover's song. So as we apply this night for us in particular, our relationship with Christ is a love story. Your personal relationship with Jesus Christ 
Okay, I mean you personally, privately, you and Jesus. It is a love story. How much he loves you and therefore how much you love him. He loved you so much that he gave his only unique, one-of-a-kind son so that you would not have to pay the price for it and the penalty for your sin. So that he paid it on your behalf. So that by faith in him, you come into life. And, and life abundant and life everlasting. Okay? And so our response to show him how much we love him is to sing our songs a little louder. Well, maybe, maybe not. To, uh, to, to just make sure we memorize 100 verses a month. Well, maybe, maybe not. Or maybe it's to show him how much we love him in response. We obey what he has shown us. If we love him, we obey him. And we follow him. And, and we, we do what he has shown us and role model for us. It is a love story. A love story is one that is about Chunky Baptist Church as a whole, as well as the individualized and personalized ones that involve all of us. Christ is as devoted to us that is right here, right now, as it is to the bride, the church as a whole. But are we as devoted to him as our bridegroom in terms of scripture? How do you view your loved ones today? Does your love, like that of the text, elevate the other sense of self-worth? Because it should. Encouraging one another, building one another up, being a presence in their life. That sometimes it's not necessarily words. You don't always have to be eloquent. You don't always have to pronounce the right words, or in my case, mangle the English language and create brand new words, although that is a fun and exciting thing to do. No, just simply being a presence, coming alongside that person somehow, letting them know that you care, sharing that joy of the Lord, which is one of our things, you know, pursuing prayer, promoting joy, and proclaiming Christ. We are reminded that true love elevates. It never deflates the other. We live in a culture that will use you, abuse you, manipulate you, and when it's done with you, crinkle you up like an old piece of paper and chunk you out when you can no longer offer uh, what it is the world thinks you have to offer. That's not how the love of God is, and that's not how the love of God within us as a church body is or ever should be. We love one another at every age and every stage, walking with one another uh, in that love of Christ, knowing that we are a part of the bride of Christ, Delighting in Him, delighting in one another, and therefore devoted to Him. And because we are devoted to Him, we are then therefore devoted to one another. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. I think of a peacock. You ever see a peacock? You ever hear a peacock? Hear it. Especially when you don't know it's there. Uh, that, that can get your prayer life revved up. Let me tell you is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, bearing, oh, sorry, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. Colossians 3, 12 and 14. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, that is, the bride of Christ, put on tender mercies. Now, in the Greek, <laughs> it is, means a, a deep affection. Literally, if you translate it, put on bowels of affection. But we don't use that type of terminology as we're talking to one another. It is a little bit different, I grant you. But it's that deep affection. It's not just a passing fancy, oh, I got your back as long as you got mine. Oh, oh it's good to see you this Sunday, and then I ain't have nothing to do with the rest of the week, and then come back Sunday, well, hey, how you doing? No, it's that deep affection that we are part of, a, of a living family of faith who delights in the Lord because he has first loved us, and who delight in one another because of that love, and who are devoted to the Lord who first loved us, and therefore devoted to one another a, a deep sense of love and devotion here. So therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. So you almost 
Try again. So you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. We can disagree on a lot of issues. We can have strong stances. We can be zealous. Remember, let me caution you to always filter our, uh, your, your, your zeal uh, through the Holy Spirit because zeal without meekness always leads to fanaticism. So you always want to have the Holy Spirit, the one, let him have the reins. Let him be the one to either hold you back or say, get it, let's go. Whichever one's appropriate, let him have the reins, not you, not me. But in all these things, it's that love for one another. A church that has the joy of the Lord, which is the, is the strength of that church, a church that has the joy is a church that loves one another. That's what people in Chunky are looking for because there's broken uh, people and there's sharp angles. Try it again. Sharp angles. I almost said sharp angels, but that wouldn't have made sense. Sharp angles and, and a lot of uh, you know, some uncomfortableness. But you and I, that's a new word, write that down, uncomfortableness. I don't know exactly how I pronounce that, but write it down, I have the copyright. Uncomfortableness, there you go. So the church is, is the part of that, uh, being able to, to reach out to the people who are in that situation and simply love them as they are with an eye as to who and what they can be in Christ. I have opportunity to minister to people sometimes, uh, even in recent days. And, you know, it's easy to look at somebody and judge them like, man, that's just some kind of stupid man. You know, I mean, it's easy to take a very negative approach. The Pharisees did it all the time. I mean, imagine, you know, uh, Levi, a.k.a. Matthew, he gets saved. He's, he's like the IRS agent of his day, right? And so he gets saved. Jesus says, follow me. And he gets up, he closes his shop, and he follows Jesus. That night, he's having a party. And who, who does he invite? Well, the only other people he knows to invite besides the 12. And Jesus, he invites the other tax collectors. You know, every IRS agent uh, he can think of. There they are. And so the Pharisees were there. Apparently, they got an invite too. Or either they just showed up scribes and Pharisees. And they're thinking, why is this man associating with tax collectors? Sinners. Don't, don't he know that they deserve the lowest? Of Hades, don't they, don't they, he doesn't he know that, that they are just they're not worth it? Aren't you glad Jesus doesn't look at you and I that way? Because he said, Listen, it's not the well who need a physician. Okay, how many of you go to the doctor because you feel good? You know, I mean, maybe for a wellness checkup or something, I get it, but I mean, you know, I feel pretty good right now. Say that before watch me fall down. No, I feel pretty good. So I'm not going to get up at, say, 8 o'clock in the morning and go to the clinic because, well, hey, I'm here to uh, see, see the doctor and why. What's wrong? No, nothing wrong. I just feel good. Oh. Uh, now, if, I, if I'm running fever, if I have a sore throat, if I'm, if I'm achy and tired, if something's not, you know, going wrong right in my body, then, yeah, chances are I'm going and I'm going to complain. And I'm going to say, here's what's the deal. Uh, what can we do? Especially when I have to get a shot. I'd rather have a shot than, than give me those nasty force pills, okay? Uh, I beg for a shot because I hate having to swallow force pills. And then I tell you how much I hate having to swallow pills, okay? If I can't get it in a gummy, I'll just give it to the shot, okay? Uh, but anyway, you know, it's not the well. It's not the people who are feeling good that need the doctor. Those are sick. In like manner, Jesus told the, the, the Pharisees, and he told the scribes, I have come to call sinners, not the righteous, to repentance. Always, when you look at other people, whether they're within the church or in our community, don't look, them, look at them as how they are. Look at them as who they can be. See them as Jesus sees them. With that love, that sense of holy affection, that holy acknowledgement that says, you know, there's more to you than what you're doing or where you are. As we are reminded that Jesus gives us our real sense of self-worth in him, that he and only he brings out the best in us. You know, in any dating relationship, the other preacher's done gone to medicine now, but that's my job, that's what I do. Um, you know, in any dating relationship, you need to bring out the best in that other person. And that other person needs to bring out the best in you. And together, you need to be lifting up Jesus Christ. Keep it clean. Keep it holy. Okay? Uh, not tearing one another down or using one another for whatever you can get. I saw too much of that in 16 years at Benton Academy. 
Okay, uh, so for those of you who are dating or who might be dating or will be dating one day, you know, get started right. Build the other person up. Lift that person up. Pray for that other person. Right? <coughs> Help them to find their sense of self-worth, not in you or you and them. That's codependent behavior and that's not healthy. But find your self-worth, find your identity in Jesus Christ who loves you and gives you the dignity and the value and the worth that he and only he can give so that you and I then are able to reflect his beauty and we're able to diffuse his fragrance in our lives that are lived for him. We are highly prized then like that rose of Sharon or that lily of the valley, are we not? And for those who are married, let me go meddling here too. Do the same thing. Build each other up. So we've been married for a long time. Wonderful. Then pray that much harder that God would diffuse His fragrance through your marriage and family. Because there's a hurting chunky out there that needs to see within us the redemptive love of Jesus Christ as part of the body. And for, and for those who are in any kind of, of relationship you know, situation, it comes back to that redemptive love of Jesus Christ, reaching out with an open hand and compassion, never the clenched fist, as part of the bride of Christ, that we are diffusing His fragrance everywhere we go. Now know that to some we may be the stench of death because we will never compromise on the Word of God. What the Word of God says is sin, we will call sin. We will not call it an uh-oh or an indiscretion. We will call it sin. And what God's Word says is a blessing, we will call it a blessing. And for some, they don't want to hear that. I get it. Not everybody's going to like us and love us. Jesus did not call us to be successful. He called us to be faithful. There are so many others that are looking for that hope. Others that are looking for that sense of joy, that sense of, of purpose, that sense of belonging. And you find it in the body of Christ, in the bride of Christ, in that personal relationship. Matthew Henry says, the lily is a very noble plant. It grows to a considerable height, but has a weak stem. The church is weak in herself, yet is strong in Christ that supports her. You and I, we are that lily among the thorns that are around us. But here's the good news. Those thorns, by the grace of God, can be transformed. Let God use you as, as a church family in that regard. Our love and devotion, like that of the bride in the text, is to be held exclusively for Jesus. We're his precious bloom. We are his beloved. He is our husbandman or cultivator. He knows precisely how to nurture us and cause us to bloom to his full potential. So why would we want to go looking here, there, and yonder for anything or anyone else? The Bible in Psalm, uh, actually Psalm of Psalms 216. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. When Shannon and I got married, we had that part of the text. I am my beloved's. He is mine. As a church, Jesus is our beloved. And we are his. The question that we always have to pause, does he belong to you today? And do you know that you belong to him? He is our rose and our lily, none compared to him. We shouldn't seek to find anything that would try his love should and it can burn brightly in us as the red colors of that Israeli rose of Sharon that we saw on the screen momentarily ago. He is, he is the fairest. Charles Spurgeon said it this way as I close. The beauties of heaven and earth meet in Jesus. Jesus is infinitely more beautiful in the garden of the soul than all the roses of the earth. He is first as the fairest among 10,000. So whatever might compete with him today for your affection, your attention, your allegiance, your affirmation, whatever would compete, identify it, get rid of it, and cling to him. What might seek to compare to him today? Because there is no comparison. The rose and the lily symbols of God's love and faithfulness to his people and that binding covenant 
is also symbolized by marriage that we know from experience. It's a picture of that union of Christ and the, and the church. All of that saying he's faithful to us now. And he helps us to be faithful to him. And as we are faithful to him, then others can see that. Sometimes it's not so much what they hear as what they're seeing and what they're experiencing. It's a beautiful picture. Christ's love for us. Our love for Christ, one of acknowledgement, affection, and affirmation. And now Israel, when you put Chunky Baptist, what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, Deuteronomy 10, verse 12, which brings us to the most important moment, which is, as our worship leaders come, when we stand and sing our hymn of invitation, is your response. Is the Lord Jesus, the, the rose of Sharon and the lily to you? If there's a question mark, I invite you, let's come to this altar and let's name it down tonight. So that it's an exclamation point and not a question mark. There may be some other thing that you need to just come and pray over. Uh, this is the time that you respond to Jesus in whatever shape, form, or fashion that may be. You come. Take my life. Leave me, Lord. Let that be your response tonight.